All right, guys, welcome back to the show. In today's episode, we're going to go over a couple of unique topics. I'm excited for this one because I've never done a short sale. We're going to go over short sales with an expert today. We're also going to touch on high equity pre foreclosures. Let me introduce you to my expert guest, Brian Mira. How you doing, Brian? Welcome to the show. Doing great, Connor. Doing great. Yeah, man. So I'm excited to get you on here because short sales is something that someone uh, that people ask me all the time about when I travel around and I don't really know what to tell them. I'm like, look, this is not a transaction that I do. So let's talk about this today. So I understand it. I just don't do them. What is a short sale? So by definition, a short sale occurs when one owes more on their mortgage, right? The balance of their mortgage or mortgages than they can currently sell the house for. Um, it's generally caused with a distressed situation. Um, the most common being divorce, right? right. Um, or maybe the second probably being job loss. And the third, I'm thinking about the statistics, I believe is um, uh, their health illness, right? So somebody gets sick, they lose their job, or they're going through a divorce. Regardless of the cause, they can't pay the mortgage anymore. And now they fall behind on their payments. Well, they can't just go list it with a realtor in a standard listing and try and sell it because maybe they owe two fifty dollars on the mortgage still, but the house value is currently only worth 200000 The reason for the decline in value could be numerous reasons. It could be because maybe they haven't kept up with the house, right? Maintenance. Uh, maybe that particular neighborhood went, went you know, depreciated and went down in value. Or possibly maybe they took out like an FHA loan, which is very common, where somebody only puts down 3.5%. So from the very beginning, they don't have much equity. And now this is declining in value, and you have an underwater negative equity situation. Right, right. So so what's going on in the short sale market right now? Are there a lot of them in the market still? Or is this something, since we've been on such a boom for so many years now, there's a lot of equity in the market? It would seem to me that there's not a lot of short sales out there. Is that what's going on? You know what? Yes and no. And, and here's how I'll answer that. There are still a lot of short sales. There always will be. There always have been because until people stop getting divorces, losing their jobs and getting cancer, you're always going to have a short sale, right? right. Now, there are certain um, obviously times where there's more in the marketplace. Of course, if you think back 10 years ago to the crash, they were everywhere. Most markets have had a comeback, right? The, the, the values have appreciated and come back, et cetera. But you're always going to have those illness situations, those negative equity situations. So I don't care where you're at in the country. If you go on any MLS anywhere in the nation, you're always going to be able to find short sales. There's nowhere near as many as there used to be, but they're still there. Now, that being said, there's also certain key pockets where there's a lot of activity with short sales. For example, we're seeing a lot of them. I'm originally from New Jersey. I live hanging out the bridge. New Jersey still leads the nation in foreclosures and therefore in short sales. So New Jersey never really recovered for numerous different reasons. Um, it's a judicial state, so there's a process to go through the courts. And generally, the average is that when someone stops paying their mortgage to foreclosure, it's around 14 to 16 months. So you could see that amount of time going by, and there's this tremendous backlog that they've never really been able to catch up on. You also have certain pockets of Florida that there's still a lot of short sales, um, Las Vegas, Houston. So yeah, there's certain key pockets where there's a large amount of activity. But overall, it has really slowed down. But um, you know, I, I've been doing this for 11 years, and uh, I'm still getting deals on my desk every week because I operate nationwide. You know, <laughs> right, right. So I guess one of the biggest things people come to me when they talking about short sales is that they're concerned about the process with the bank. It seems to be over their head. Also, that the timing of it, they hear that oh, well, short sales are great, and you can make a big paycheck on it, but they take 50 years, right? But not really. They take six months or so. What's the typical time frame uh, of one of these transactions that you're doing? And is it as difficult as people kind of drum it up to be? Or is this something that's quite an easy process? It just takes time to play out. So to your first question, um, there's nothing short about a short sale, I always say, right? <laughs> they're, they're better. They're, they don't take as long as they used to. I mean, I remember when I first got started 11 years ago, they were taking around six to nine months. Um, I've had deals that I've fought and worked with over two years, right? Um I would say the average is around three to four months, right? Uh, but if you're willing to stick in there, it, it generally there's there's a good payoff, right? right. Um, banks are still discounting. I don't care what people tell you. A lot of people say, oh, they're not discounting anymore. Well, that's not true. They are discounting if you know how to properly work to file. And when I say work to file, I mean build your case, if you will, and present what the current true market value is in a distressed situation. Um, years ago, there was a report came out by uh, Freddie Mac and stated that a distressed property, such as a short sale, intrinsically has a 22% less market value just to pay, you know, based upon the fact that it's a distressed asset um, because it's unsellable in its current condition, right? If you go back to that example, 250 and it's only worth 200, you can't sell the house. 
So that that takes the value down. That certainly depreciates that. Um, as far as how hard it is, it's not a matter, Connor, of being hard or difficult, if you will. It's a matter of being diligent. Right. And it's a matter of being consistent and persistent with your follow-up with the bank because you're going to be required to send in the documents, and they're going to give you the list of what you have to send in. Any secretarial person could organize that and send it in. And then you follow it through the life cycle of the short sale, which is the valuation, the counter offer, and finally get the you know your final negotiations and your close. But you know, so there's a whole algorithm, if you will, and process for to get it done. But um, I, I encourage people all the time. I say, you know, I, I first of all, I don't sell my course anymore, so I'm not you know saying this to sell anybody anything. <laughs> I, I shut that down years ago. But um, when I did you know sell the course and do the coaching and all, I would encourage everybody to just get out there and do it. You know, be the negotiator. You know, don't worry about hiring one and, and getting an independent contractor to deal with the bank. Do one yourself so you can really, you know, get your hands dirty and see what the inner workings of a short sale are. Because if you are going to then outsource and hire someone to, to perform that task for you, you can't really do that unless you've done one yourself or two. Right, right. So yeah. um, as far as, you know, what I'm traditionally seeing, we're seeing that people who do short sales doing a lot larger transaction. The profits are huge on these on these transactions. Why is it that? They're willing to discount it so much compared to what you can go to a normal motivated seller for. Well, again, it all comes down to the valuation because you have to understand that people get confused. The The person that you're dealing with on the phone or through the computer, meaning the bank negotiator, it's not their deal. You understand? They're right. a service. And it's not their manager's deal or their supervisor. There's a note holder. There's an actual person or company that holds the note. That could be Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. If it's a GSC, it could be an individual investor like you and me that own a bunch of notes. So there's an investor behind the loan. Now, the investor will give the servicer the guidelines of minimum parameters and what they're willing to accept, et cetera, terms, conditions, et cetera. Right. So right. if you are able to know going in that the only way they're going to make a decision to approve a deal is if they feel that it's going to be in their best interest to sell the house short to you as the investor as compared – to have to take it back in a foreclosure auction, because what does that mean? Now they have to list the house with a realtor, possibly do some repairs to get it up to full market value. Now they're paying carrying costs every month to maintain the house, the property insurance, the taxes, the utilities, et cetera. So it's being shown. Then assuming you know you, they got to look at the average days on market in that area, now they're carrying costs for that amount of time. There's a direct cost associated with the foreclosure auction with the sheriff, et cetera, you know, the processing, the attorneys, et cetera, huge cost. And then when they end up selling it, they got to pay 6% to the REO agent. Right. So they know what that net number is. Believe me, they have all the calculations done, days on market, realtor, da -da, and they have a net figure. As long as your net figure as the investor is greater than that, they're going to accept the deal. Right. Because they're going to get their money faster, they're going to net more, and it all comes down to math. Right. Well, it also takes the emotion out of it, and they're just basing on numbers where you're working with a homeowner. It's their cash that they put in the house, and they don't want to give it up as easily. So it's their cash, and in a distress situation, Connor, you have the fact that when someone's losing their house, and I know from firsthand experience, which is what launched me into this business, I went through a divorce in 2007, went out and got my real estate license to survive, frankly, because that's when things were booming, right? I always <laughs> tell people, you know, back then, before the crash, a blind dog with a note in his mouth that sell real estate, right? You were you were an order taker. You didn't really need any skills. I mean, there was bidding wars and nationwide, right? Right. Um, so when that happened, you know, obviously going through a divorce, I wasn't able to maintain two homes after I moved out. My wife and I got separated. So the house went into foreclosure. So I lived through it. And I know what it's like to get those calls all day long and the threatening letters. And, you know, from a homeowner's perspective, it is very personal. It is very emotional. And so I think the better job an investor can do to be a little empathetic and relate to the homeowner in the situation that they're in, they're going to go a lot further, you know, and uh, frankly, that's going to turn into referrals because if you treat people right and have a little, again, empathy, um, that's kind of what, that's how I've always operated. And I think having gone through that, which was a horrible thing to go through, um, it, it kind of, you know, until you walk a mile in a man's shoes, like they say, right? So, right. well, I agree. And no, I think that's great. I mean, sometimes uh, what seems to be an incredible, horrible point in our life turns into a blessing. So it led you down this process where you actually create a new career out of it, right? So, absolutely. Now, let's look yep. at, let's look at the process of how you'd even find these deals. Is going direct to the bank the number one way of doing this? Or how would you, is there a way to go after short sales? It's not like a list to go after these types of leads, is there? Or can you find uh, properties that are underwater? Or, or how would you go about this? Okay, so a few things. Um, no, you cannot go to the bank. Um, the bank is not going to give you a list of mortgages that are currently in default. That's never going to happen. Okay. 
I don't even know if that's legal, frankly. <laughs> so what you can do and what I always re relied heavily upon and what I taught when I was coaching and in my course was what I call the realtor referral method. And what I mean by that is by law, every short sale has to be listed with an agent. OK, so if you find a local real estate agent in your area who is working short sales, knows what they're doing, there's generally a handful in every market who tend to gravitate toward short sales. Right. right. Well, again, they have to be listed. And so you as the investor, you're bringing a cash offer. Right. And you're going to close right away. No inspections. You're, you know, you're going to take the risk and you let them know what my value proposition was, is that we're going to do all the heavy, heavy lifting for you. You know, in fact, I coined the term to agents. Hey, listen, you'll never talk to the bank and I'll never touch your commission. So you can go out there and do what you do best, which is list homes and work with buyers. I'm going to do all the work with the bank, you know, and get this done. We have a 95 percent closing ratio and you can go on and do what you do. So to, to be able to approach a realtor that way and, and and why wouldn't they take your offer if you're a cash buyer, you get the house under contract right away. Oh, and by the way, they don't have to do any work. So that's the number one way to get it. The second best way is to target the homeowners direct that are in distress. Right. Pre closures. Um, you can buy these lists anywhere. I happen to like, I'm sure you know RealFlow, really flow yep. with their software. I use, yep, use RealFlow. Yeah, so I've used RealFlow since 2008, 10 years, um, maybe 11 actually. But anyway, um, in their, what they call lead pipes, there's actually, you, you can actually log in and download in your area, people that are in pre-foreclosure. Right. Um, from that point, you can knock on the door, you can do a handwritten letter, you could uh, send them a postcard cross-reference, you know, get some phone numbers and start making phone calls. So that's an, an excellent way to uh, generate leads from homeowners. So there's two ways right there, getting them from the realtors or going direct to the homeowners, utilizing lists such as from RealFlow or if you don't want to subscribe to that service, it might be a hundred bucks a month or something. Right, um, right. You can go online and buy lists of um, pre-foreclosures. Uh, you can also, in fact, go down to the courthouse because once somebody's in default, which is 90 days after they haven't made a payment, uh, a Liz pendants is filed at the courthouse. So some courthouses have these records online. You don't even have to get your car and you could do some research on the current Liz Pendens filed, um, you know, for the houses in pre-foreclosure and then go ahead and make your list and start contacting them from there. Okay, cool, cool. Thank you. So guys, RealFlow is a back office CRM type of management system. We'll go ahead and put a link below here if you want to go check that out. Now let's go over uh, like just an overhead view of a quick process of how this would go through. We don't want to go too deep, too deep into detail because it'd take forever, but from Reaching out to the agent through the whole process, kind of step by step, like what would come next? You reach out to the agent, say, I want to put a short sale offer in, you right. submit the offer. Where does the time delay happen? Like, what is what's going on behind the scenes? So, actually, if you want to really start in the beginning, it starts with your analysis. Okay. You have to analyze the deal. You have to really understand what the true market value is in its present situation. And only a realtor with access to the MLS can give you those comps, right? Zillow is not going to cut it. We want real MLS comps and we want to see, okay, this house in today's market in its current condition, what is it worth? With no, no repair. Right. Then we want to know what are the lowest comps available? So like to like, apple to apple, if this is a three bedroom, you know, two bath colonial, we want other three bedroom, two bath colonials or at a minimum three bedroom, two bath single families. What are the three lowest that we can find on record, right? Generally within six months of time going back and without, you know, within a mile's radius, suburbia, right? And we have the, the three lowest comps, and we come up with an average of a low. We have its current value, and then we want to look at the after repair value. So we want three very specific sets of comps. Our starting offer, we take the lowest value, we take three of them and average them out, and we start at around 65 to 80% of that figure. That's our starting offer. So once the analysis is done, your paperwork gets put together, and there's your first roadblock. There's an extensive amount of paperwork that the homeowner has to put together to even initiate a short sale at the bank. We find that that's where they actually drag their feet. So getting their tax documents together, their returns, their W-2s, their pay stubs, their bank statements, writing a hardship letter, all the things the bank's going to require and numerous, numerous other things. Right. We find that that's actually the biggest – one of the biggest bottlenecks is with the actual seller in distress getting their paperwork together. So once the package is together and we finally have it, it gets submitted into the bank. The next milestone that you're waiting for is the valuation. Now, generally, they're going to do a BPO, a broker price opinion, right? They're going to send out an agent to take some pictures, walk through the house, and give them an, an estimated idea of value. If it's an FHA loan or a VA loan or a jumbo loan, they're going to go ahead and do a full-blown appraisal, okay? Once the value comes back into the bank through the negotiator at the bank through back to the investor, they're going to say, okay, here's the value. Here's the investor offer. They counter you, okay? Once 
you enter that phase, now you're in the counter offer situation where you go back and forth, you can send additional supporting data, here's the repairs it needs, right? Which by the way, you should have sent in the beginning, but you know, <laughs> maybe you know, two months have gone by now, and now maybe there's new, newer comps that are even lower that you could send in. Um, things of that nature. Finally, you're gonna come to a, a figure, right? An agreement, if you will, and you're gonna get the approval letter and you go to closing. That's kind of like the quick, sped up version of the life cycle of a short sale. Right, now clearly you're an expert, to what you just went over is great information, but to the average agent or average investor out there, they're going to need some walking through this, some handholding. Yeah. I know you do that quite a bit. Are you open to people reaching out to to you if they have a short sale to partner with them or is this something you're still doing? I know you do. Uh, no, it's not. Um, I shut that down, uh, Connor, because I got too busy. Um, right. I'm actually shifting. So while I'm still doing short sales, I think we're working on about 12 right now, uh, maybe 11, but um. I'm doing them, but I'm very selective and I really, yeah, I got one in Houston and, you know, I'm looking at one in Maryland, et cetera, but I'm really trying to focus more where I'm from, which is the New Jersey, Pennsylvania area, okay. because there's more than enough here to keep me busy because I've also <laughs> shifted um, into a new model that I'm pursuing and, and have been working on for about a year, which is called the high equity pre-foreclosure model. So I don't want to say I'm shifting away from short sales. I just, after 11, almost 12 years, I don't want that to be my main focus anymore. Um, and if you put that call to action, I might have a hundred people call me tomorrow and, and <laughs> I, I'm not the guy. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. That's <Not> more. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about that. What you just brought up high equity pre foreclosures. This is an interesting topic. I think a lot of people, uh, want to hear what you have to say. So what is a high equity pre foreclosure and why is this now your main focus? So interestingly enough, one of the two main parameters to even qualify getting back to the analysis of a short sale, it had to have two parameters for me to even consider it. Or frankly, for any of you guys listening to this to consider, it. it has to be negative equity, which means you have to have a mortgage balance or balances that are greater than what the house could sell for. It has to have negative equity. And then secondly, it has to be in default. They have to be at least one full payment behind because if they're not, the bank's not even going to consider negotiating because they're current. So many, many times along the way over all these years, I've run across situations where they were in default, but there was equity. And if there's equity, why would the bank short sell it? They could just foreclose, resell it as a bank owned REO and make all their money back without having to cut a discount, right? So I would always walk away from those deals. Now, when I define a high equity pre foreclosure, I define it as a house that's in default, uh, generally very close to the auction, um, preferably close to the auction. That's when everybody's willing to negotiate, right? right. And yeah. having an equity stake of at least 150000 or more. So in our example, once again, um, if they owed two fifty on the mortgage, the house is worth four hundred thousand. Now a lot of people may immediately say, "Well, wait a minute, why don't they just list it with a realtor and sell it?" Well, maybe they don't want to move. You know, most times and more times than not, someone didn't buy a house to want to leave it. So they fell on hard times. A tragedy happened, but their kids are going to the school. They're barbecuing with the neighbors. You understand? They have their friends. They, it's their neighborhood. It's where they live with their family. They don't want to move. So they're exhausting every option. They're looking into bankruptcy and they're looking into loan modifications and all of these different things to try and save their home. But when you're about a week to two weeks to 30 days outside of a sheriff's sale, an auction, you're probably out of, out of options, right? So what we do is we come in and using private capital, we will pay off the mortgage balance or balances, but we also pay off all the debt that they have. We want them to be completely debt free. So if they have a car note, if they have credit cards, student loans, um, their kids braces with a loan at the doctor, right? Whatever it is, we want them to be completely debt free. So we use our fund, write a check, pay off everything. We pay off the bank. Now by doing so, the bank is not being shorted. So there's no restrictions on what we can do. So we take ownership, we take the deed. Right. We right. lease the house back to the homeowner for a period of two years. So they're staying in the house, which is what they wanted to do anyway. And we resell it back to them after two years. Why? Because by paying off of their debt, we found that in about six to 12 months, their credit completely restores itself because there's no more debt. Right. They don't need to right. get into credit repair, credit counseling, simply pay off all the debt and surprise, magically a year later, you have credit in the 700s. That's how it works. Right. Right. So by paying off of the debt, utilizing private capital, we're keeping them in the home. They're debt free. They make one payment that they can manage to us, the investor, every month. We resell it back to them at the term of two years. They get to keep their house, get their house back. And uh, everybody wins. So the bank didn't have a foreclosure. The, the, the family got to stay in their home. We And we don't take all their equity, by the way. Let's be real clear about that. Some people said, oh, your equity is stripping. No, we charge a flat fee, a percentage of the equity for our services. 
Well, how much is it? Well, it depends on the amount of equity and how much debt they have. So that's not just a flat answer. But we charge a flat fee. It could be anywhere from twenty dollars to $50,000, meaning the other one hundred and thirty to uh, hundred grand of equity they keep. Right. We're not taking their equity. We're charging for our service. And trust me, they're very happy that we step in and save them in their home. And they're willing to give us a small percentage for the service that we provide. Now, as an investor, Connor, what's awesome about that, there's no negotiating with the bank. None. They're getting paid off. We write them a check. So the, all that headache and back and forth that people that I've dealt with over the last 11, 12 years goes away overnight. It's gone, <laughs> right? In addition to that, there's no rehab. There's no rehab. They're already living there. We're not fixing up the house. And it comes tenant occupied, which is the homeowner. And who's going to better take care of their home because it's their home. You don't have to worry about maintenance. Right. So it's a brilliant model. Um, the only reason I haven't rolled it out nationwide and actually expanded further is for um, lack of capital. You know, if you're stroking three, four hundred thousand dollar checks, you tend to run out of money pretty quick. You right. know what I mean? So, well, that's what I was about to ask you is um, how are you financing this on the front end? I know you said you pulled out of your fund, but what type yeah. of uh, structure are you creating that loan for? Are you just trying to create it so that when they pay you their monthly rent that you wash out and your main profit center is coming from so the, the transaction transactional income from that twenty to fifty K? We're paid up front. So at closing, we're taking our fee. And what we're utilizing is private capital. So, for example, maybe some of your listeners, they have money in a 401k. They're making three, four, five percent returns, maybe six if they're killing it, right? <laughs> um, or God forbid they got money in a bank CD, <laughs> one, one and a quarter percent. Or they got mattress money making zero. But I tell people it's not zero. You're losing two percent due to inflation. So right. people, well, like that. That. <laughs> yeah, people with access to capital, private investors who want to deploy their money in a very safe investment in the sense that there's no rehab. There's no fix and flip. You don't have to worry about contractors going over time or over budget. And we give them a flat 10% annualized rate of return, and it's secured. And if they want, they can actually take possession and take the deed. And so it's a hands-off turnkey investing model for investors, and we've been very successful going to professionals in our local area, doctors, attorneys, businessmen, et cetera, um, that want a secure investment in real estate, but they don't want to have to get their hands dirty, and they want to minimize their risk. Right. So it's, we've been very effective in that, and um, we're actually in the process of creating a fund uh, with numerous different private investors to uh, – you know, put that together, doing a PPM and all that as we speak. So that's kind of where the model is right now. All right. So how do you get your, so say you're going to make a 25 K commission or transactional fee. How is that structured? Is it paid at closing? Like how, yeah. how, so you're going to fund it. Say, let's say you have a house for 200 K. It's got 50 K in liabilities, judgments back, everything to pay off is 250. The house is worth 400. How would the numbers work at closing? You're going to come in, fund the 250. Mm-hmm. Where's the bridge and all the debt. Right. Include our, our fee, 20 to 40 to 50 grand, depending on how much we negotiate. Uh, our fee is included. We build a reserve for as taxes and interest. We also build in six months of payments, which is more security for the investor because it's the investor. It's that doctor. It's the guy with the private money making small single digit returns that is now going to make a 10 to 11 percent return. Right. We want to give them the security. Right. So what we do is they cut the check that pays for everything at closing, including our fee. All the reserves are put into an escrow account, right? Managed by our attorneys and our uh, accountants, and uh, and away we go. All right. So he would fund. You'd borrow what, like two ninety? So two ninety would wipe out the two fifty, twenty five yeah. for your profit, and another fifteen or so for six months. It's kind of how it works. That's it. And exactly. And then right. after two years, we generally start to process at eighteen months. We'll do a quick claim deed back to the homeowner, so we get it back in their name, so that when we go back to the bank to refi and take out the investor. They're going to have the seasoning of six months, and they're also going to have the credit reestablished so we can go ahead and easily get them a loan to uh, take out the investor. And it's been working about 100% of the time. Right. And do they ever you know, push to keep the deed, or do they want you to just create like a two-year note for them? or like they- Case by case. case by case. The homeowner, you mean? Yeah, the homeowner. No, 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 no. They, they understand that for the security of the investor and the instrument, we're, we're, we're taking possession of the house. We're buying it from them. Okay. And then as far as – yeah, no, okay, I get that. Yeah, so like when you're looking at – the paperwork, what type of terminology do you have in there? Obviously, you know, they got in financial trouble in the first place. Right. Paying off everything is going to make their credit go up. But what happens if they dive it back down and they continue on the same uh, habits and traits that well, put them there in the first not, place? Yeah, that's a great question and a great, great point. Um, we're not obligating them. You know, there's no mandate that they have to buy the house back. Right. Um, we could always, if the investor's happy, we could extend the terms after 24 months. Okay, right? that, that's where I was going to get it. So it's like. It's flexible. It's flexible. Or what we can do, we've only had three cases of default where basically – and, and two of them told us up front, hey, look, 
I don't want this house anymore. I can't even afford it. I just want to be able to stay here for a year. So we took some of their equity, built it into the payments where they would be able to basically live there for free for a year so they could reestablish themselves, get out. And then we buy the house after a year. We go ahead and maybe at that point we do a little renovations and we sell it and we make a larger profit. Right. Or maybe we'll you know, hold it and put another tenant in there and keep it as a, a buy and hold. So our exit strategies are unique in that we already have the money for the deal. So we can create a separate note and offer uh, seller financing. Right. So our exit strategies are quite limitless once we control the property. And uh, that's kind of how we get into it. Right. So it's kind of in a, in a weird way, kind of like a lease option, you know, so if they get there, yeah. yeah. Cause if they can pay it off and refi, um, like what is like the percentage rate that you're seeing? Like, I don't know how many of y'all of these y'all have done, but 90 plus percent of people are able to qualify and finance out in a couple of years or how many so, people buy the property we, back? Yeah. So we collectively meeting myself um, and two other gentlemen who've been doing this for the past. Actually, he started this back in 2003. So you're talking about <laughs> 15 years of experience. Right. Um, primarily in New Jersey, a few other states, right? Uh, Pennsylvania, D.C., and I believe Maryland. Um, over 300 of these successfully completed. Only three people didn't buy it back. Wow. So what is that? One tenth of one percent? It's a lot. <laughs> That's all you need to know. It's, it's good. So I like that strategy. I mean, I think it's uh, good. I mean, you have to be in a little higher price point market. It's not going to work for all markets. But for those oh. of you in average sales. My math is bad. That three out of 300 will be 1%. Okay. <laughs> is that yeah, you're right. Ninety nine percent, still pretty 90%. good. That's not bad, right? That's not bad. Hey, we we can only do what we can do, right? That's so, right. um, now you're going to be in these situations where, even though you're coming in with quick cash, what happens on the fact that what happens if you can't get a payoff from them, or what happens if there's an issue with the title before and it's going to go past the foreclosure date? What so, is we run? T- I'm glad you asked that. We say we have many um safeguards in place. So once we determine it's a deal, we sit down with the homeowner. Once they're on board and they want to do this, the very first thing we do is run title, right? right? And we pull their credit. We're not going to just take their word that this is what they owe on, on their mortgage and this is what they owe. We're going to get payoffs, right? Um, we're going to see if they say they owe 17000 on their Amex. We're going to make sure it's seventeen, not twenty seven, right? So right. we're going to do our due diligence in the beginning process before we do anything. As right. far as the bank, you know, you can generally get a – a foreclosure adjourned and postponed if you let them know you're attempting to do a short sale. Not all the time, but but more times than not, if you know what to say, you could probably get a – they'll give you a little time to see if you can work this out. Once again, they generally don't want to take the house back. Right. Are there occasions where the bank says, no, nah, you know what? We're just going to auction anyway. Sure, it happens. But in cases like this, it doesn't happen 0% of the time because the phone call is a little different. Not saying, hey, give us more time to see how much we can short you. The phone call is – we're paying you in full, but we need a little more time. Is that okay? Sure. Take all the time you need. <laughs> right. Hey, it works, right? So getting all your money, we're not discounting, but we need another 30 days. Not a problem. <laughs> well, what, what about, I mean, cause what, what happens if someone contacts you five days before the sale? And I mean, we okay. just, we just had a house that, you know, there was a major issue in the beginning where the guy was an older gentleman. He was a lien holder or, or he, he had, he owned the house. He passed away. The son, there was no probate, no will. He owner financed the house that people were buying the house from, and we got to closing. And the, or we're getting ready to get to closing. The tile company's like, we can't close this. We don't. We're not be able to figure this out. So we had to stop the foreclosure. What are some of the ways that if this does happen, that y'all stop foreclosure? Because um, this is a common question people ask. How how do I stop this if it's getting to that point? So again, in this high equity situation, it's it's as we just said, it's a phone call. It's getting it's getting on the phone with the bank and and possibly the attorney representing the the law firm representing the bank in the foreclosure and let them know that you will be paying this off in full. You're going to need to send in supporting documentation for that. You're going to need to send in a fully signed executed contract between right. you and the seller showing that you are in fact under contract to buy the home. You're also going to need to send in proof of funds showing you actually have the money, the liquid money, uh, to be able to complete the purchase. So when you do that, it's never been an issue, not even one time. Right? Are you sending? Not, literally not once. As far as also what you're sending them, do you send the bank your title company information showing that the title's open at the title company, or do you all send in your, your I guess you did say your lender's information? Um, yeah, I mean. I haven't had to yet. I haven't had to. Just, just the uh, purchase and sales agreement or sales contract, depending on the terminology around the country, um, and your proof of funds, you know, actual, real, not some fake printed off proof of funds letter, but actual, right. you know, bank statements or private equity. Um, yeah, that's, that's never failed. 
So how deep do y'all go into targeting? Are y'all buying pre-foreclosure lists and doing a blanket marketing strategy? Or are you actually buying these lists and going through and going into the, the back office MLS in your area and finding the mortgage states and looking and kind of reversing in to see how much equity is in them? Or how far are you digging into the, so the data? One of my partners created a software. And what software does is it accesses the direct MLS data, the public records, cross-references with a public tool such as Zillow. Right. Which again, right. as investors, that's you certainly don't want to make your purchase decision based on that. But as a good initial scrub to determine those 150,000 equity spreads and up, it is a good, pretty good filter. Um, once we run the report, which we run on a weekly basis, it's going to identify a certain number of homes in that county with 150,000 up. Now we go to level two research because that's not going to show second leads, right? So it doesn't do any good if you only owe 250, it's worth four, but they got a hundred thousand line of credit with Bank of America. That's not going to work, right? <laughs> so that's where you get into the uh, lower court searches where we involve our title companies to then do a lower. So in other words, it's a, la it's a layered process. First, the algorithm, the software will go ahead and scrub and pull on a weekly basis to houses that target, um, qualify based upon the target parameters, specifically the equity position, right? From there, it goes into level two where we run lower core search and we look for any seconds, anything else, and then we continue to filter it down. Once it meets that test, we have a series of mailers. We have direct postcards. We have uh, letters. We have a actual – I don't have any with me. We have a notice that we actually will pay runners to go out and tape to the front door in red. Your house is going to auction next week. We can help you call right. us now. It's about a 95% callback rate. It's crazy um, because, again, the reason – their house is on the auction block like next week, right? right? Two weeks from now. They don't have time to wait. They call back, right? Are you serious? Is this a scam? Let Ma'am, you know, we'd love to come over, stop and talk to you, explain who we are, what we do. We're local cash buyers in the area. We have over a decade of experience in the industry, and that's what we do. Right. You know? So I know one of the – and obviously people are going to be excited to hear what you just brought up because this is a good strategy. I like it. The problem is they don't you have – A bird? <laughs> It's my printer. It's actually oh, your printer. Stuttered it off. Hang on a second. <laughs> you know, your printer runs through these weird cycles to clean itself. <laughs> it's loud on this end. I don't know if you guys could hear. But anyway. I thought you said there was a bird on the window. No, no. No. <laughs> no, so like, I like the strategy. I know everybody listening likes the strategy, but the funding on the front end is going to be their issue. Now, you brought up your, you and your partner working on this, possibly creating a fund. Is this going to be something that is internally private to y'all in your own business, or is this something that people around the country can reach out to y'all and y'all will have some type of lending product to do you know, these types of transactions. I, I created the short sale course in 2011. We did a 2.0 in 2012. So I have the experience in the uh, product creation space and the consulting and the, and the coaching, the quote, I guess my old quote guru days, right? I did the whole speaking on stage and coaching and it was great. And I helped a lot of people, but you know, I've kind of moved on since that. Um, I've had two more children since then. I have five children now and there's only so many hours in the day, you know, so I, I guess I really want to kind of come on the show and share some ideas that people could pursue. Um, to answer your question more directly, the capital that we're raising is for internal purposes only because we have more deals than we have money. Right. Um, what I can tell you is that if any of your listeners, any of your lis listeners are currently interested in any passive investing, um, they can reach out to me for that and we can show them how to get a great return on their money in a, you know, what I dare I say, uh, what the FTC will allow me to say, SEC, <laughs> very safe investment, right? right. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the model. So other than kind of a passive investing like that, we're not really able to roll it out because, I mean, you're going to find these in every county in America. So any any listeners who might be interested in this strategy, a couple things I'll share with them. Um, number one, yes, you would need access to capital, right? And you know, maybe you have money in your own retirement account. You could just do one of these or two, and that's great. That, that's a great start. Um, you may be saying to yourself, well, I don't have this software, this, this search software, this algorithm to find them. Well, you don't need that either. Either you're gonna, It's going to take a little bit more elbow grease. You're going to have to maybe get your local newspaper where they publish the uh, foreclosures, right? It's a law. They got to put on public record in the paper. You guys know that. Um, you take a look at the auction dates, and then you get with a realtor, and you cross-reference, and uh, you do your research that way. It's going to take a little bit longer, but it is possible. And then you just reach out to the homeowners if you have the capital and can actually help them. And uh, propose this to them. Hey, listen, we're going to use private capital, keep you in the home. You'll be debt free. You buy it back in two years. It's not rocket science, right? And uh, if all parties are agree, you put the papers together and proceed. You know, right? Well, uh, I mean, I think we covered it all. Unless there's anything else that you think is important to bring up. I mean, guys, like he's giving you a ton of great information. We went over a couple strategies. 
Now, what you can do with this podcast is if you do have a lender in your area, show them this podcast, listen to what Brian just taught us, because I know if you liked it, I liked it, your lender is going to hear what he said. And even though you can't use their funds, it's going to open up doors for you because if you present this to them and that this is something, a model that they want to pursue, I mean, right? It's going to yeah, be. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I, I think that again, you know, what I found is when I run my real estate meetings, um, we have like a RIA. I always call it a RIA on steroids because it will. <laughs> The reason I say that, uh, Connor, is because what sets us apart, uh, my local groups, I told you I run four offices. We don't meet once a month like a real. We meet every week. Um, we have local study groups where people can plug in and study and train with us and actually do deal analysis. So it's a lot more hands-on. That's why I call it a real on steroids. Um, plus, we don't pitch any products outside of what we do, right? So we're not bringing in a speaker every month to sell their product, which is what how most RIAs operate. And that's fine. It's, it's a fine model. Uh, we just don't do that. Right. So. And I tell you all that to say that there's quite a few people who come as a guest to see our weekly overview, who we are as a community, what we do, if they like to join us, who are in that position of having some money or access to capital. They have that 401k. They have that you know, IRA. They, they have a pension. And they're just not making the returns that they would like. Right? They're getting up there in age, and they're, they, they don't have the money they'd like in the account. They're not real confident in what's going to happen with the stock market. There's a lot of talk about some major changes happening there. Um, so – Real estate is, has always been and always will be the safest investment because people will always need a place to live. Right. I believe that with this strategy, the high equity pre-foreclosures, it's even safer because you're, you're, you're number one, you're doing a service. And, and the last thing I'll say is this. One of the things that bothered me the most about short sales, and I, to this day, I don't understand why the laws haven't been updated and changed. But when someone actually does a short sale, they are not legally allowed to remain in the house. If you are an investor and you try and keep them in the house and lease it back to them after a short sale, you're actually committing fraud and could go to jail. So you don't want to do that. They got to leave. They have to leave. And they know that. We tell them right up front. But I don't agree with that. Now, whether I agree with it or not, the law doesn't care, right? But I don't think that if, if I'm a private investor and I'm buying a home, why can't I lease it back to the family after the short sale? Because they don't own it anymore. The law currently states, and there's people looking to change that, but the law currently states, yes, they have to leave. They have to vacate. In this particular model, with the high equity pre-foreclosure, because the bank didn't take a short payoff, because we paid them in full, there's no restrictions. There's no, there's literally zero affidavits or approval. Like none of that exists, so we are legally allowed to keep them in the house. And for me, having to – I don't want to use the word evict, but tell these families that by law they have to go, <clears throat> watching them pack and pack up the toys and the little kids are crying, horrible. Like it's very emotional, even, even on this side. And again, once again, because I lived through that. Right. This is awesome for me, Connor, because you're helping families. I agree. I and, think it's it, right. It, that's the intangible of what we're doing here and why it's so cool. So the investors, the doctors, the, the professionals who have some money, um, I would consider they can reach out to me for that because I would invest in one of these deals pretty much anywhere. Um, or they can utilize their capital to invest where I have more deals than I can handle right now in the New Jersey, Pennsylvania area. Right. So. That's what I will. Uh, well, I mean, to have a high equity property, you have to have a high price point property, which means these are a little bit more professional individuals. A lot of yeah. times they have ego and, and to go through a foreclosure in front of the eyes of their community and their neighbors and everything is Absolutely. incredibly brutal. Um, Absolutely. And no just to avoid that. Right. And so you're helping families and then also you're helping your business and, and the employees that you have, because if you look at it just on an overview of your competition, say you go into the house, I go into the house and another person goes in the house. And you're the only one giving them an opportunity to stay in the house while everybody yep. else is just, hey, here's a quick cash offer. Yep. I'll buy the house from you. If they do want to stay in the house, you're the only sh uh, show in town, right? So it's, it's exactly. going to – yeah, I like it. I really do. There's um, very little competition. I, I, I've, I've never come across anyone else doing this. Now, I'm sure people say, well, I've been doing that for years. Well, great. I've just never met you. <laughs> but I've, I've never heard of anybody else doing this, you know? Well, it's like one of those strategies that people do. I mean, we all do weird deals from time to time that we do them, but we didn't realize what we did when we did it. Whereas yeah. you just kind of defined it and, and put it a package around and said, this is an actual strategy and this is what we're right. focused on doing where people have probably done something similar to that just throughout the course of the business. But man, I like yeah. it. I think it's a great strategy. And guys, the more clubs you can have in your bag, the more different yeah. ways to plug leaks of cash flow coming out of your business. It's just the more ways you can close deals, the better. I mean, absolutely. But do you have any events or anything you're doing? I know you're pretty out there. Are you going anywhere soon? Can people find you or do you want to get out yeah. some information? I was invited to speak at the University of Pennsylvania for this symposium on real estate. It's, I believe, at some point in May. I haven't quite confirmed yet. I might actually be going back with my family to my house in Italy. So I'm not sure if I'll even be in the country 
<laughs> um, we, generally, we generally go back for Easter. We weren't able to make it this year. I had a few too many things going on. So we're talking about going back late May. Um, but I could let you know about that. But other than that, um, people can, uh, you know, reach me. I can give you an email or a website or whatever you think is best to give out to people. You know? yeah, man, yeah, man. Shoot them, shoot them wherever you want to go. Um, investorentourage.com is my branding, guys. Uh, it's investorentourage, uh, E-N-T-O-U-R-A-G-E.com. Uh, my email is Brian with an I, Brian at investorentourage.com. So if uh, you guys want any more information on anything we spoke about today, I'd be happy to help you. Again, just for full disclosure, I'm not really interested in doing any partnering or JVing of any <laughs> short sales around the country. Um, but now hopefully you understand why. Because what I'm doing now, there's a much better payoff and reward, both personally, emotionally, financially. It's it's just a better game, you know? Right, guys. So you heard him. He's partnering with everybody. Let's give him a thousand phone calls a day for the next week. <laughs> no, no, guys, go check him out on social media. I know he's got a YouTube channel, uh, Investor Entourage. Go subscribe to all his social media. Follow him out there. Share his stuff around, guys. Instagram, I, Twitter, the whole thing, yeah. Right, right. I mean, I, I'm grateful for you coming on here. Uh, there's some great information on short sales, high equity pre-foreclosure. I think a lot of people are going to be like, man, is this something I can implement in my own business? But um, guys, I appreciate you all coming on the show today. Brian, grateful to have you on. We'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for having me, Connor.